in church right now because somebody prayed for me. I should have been dead. I could have been in the penitentiary. But somebody prayed for me. I want to talk to us for a moment about the power of prayer. And the power of prayer. We have been now some weeks in the book of Ephesians outfitting for the battle, making ready to do spiritual warfare with the devil. For the scripture says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so if we are going to be victorious in the battle, if we are going to be engaged and enjoined in the battle, then the scripture says that there are some things we need to put on and keep on, and then there are some weapons that we ought to take up. We ought to put on the girdle of truth. We ought to put on the breastplate of righteousness we ought to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace but we've got to take up the shield of faith we've got to take up the helmet of salvation and then we've got to take up the sword of the spirit which is the word of god the only way you can be victorious in warfare against the devil is you've got to be familiar intimately with the word of God. Demons tremble at the sound of that name. Strongholds are broken when we enjoin the word of God for we have no power of ourselves. The power is in the word of God. I tried to say to us this morning that many uh, Christians have a cursory knowledge of scripture. Uh, they know the books of the Bible, but that's about it. And then there are some Christians who understand a whole lot of scripture, have a whole lot of scriptural knowledge, and they are, they are well versed on interpretation of scripture. They understand a whole lot about the Bible, but there's still not much power in that. It is not until the word is spoken. It is not until the word comes out of your mouth that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous will avail much, but you've got to speak the word. You've got to tell somebody what God has done for you. Have I got a witness here? Uh, not only must your life be an example in your everyday walk, but you've got to say something. The scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You, you've got to open your mouth. It, it's not efficacious if it's just in your mind. Because as long as the word is in your head, it's a thought. But when it comes out of your mouth... It's the spoken word. And the Holy Spirit can only do something with it when you speak power in your own life. So now we conclude in Ephesians, wrapping up the outfit for the battle. Everything we need to do battle with the devil has been given to us in the scripture, in the word of God. And here is what we need finally to be victorious over the devil. You need the power of prayer. 
Because a girdle of truth, a breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the gospel of peace without prayer is ineffective. The shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, all of those are ineffective without powerful prayer. Fervent prayer. Honest prayer. Specific prayer. Pointed, pregnant prayer. You've got to move in your prayer life from generalities to specificities. You've got to tell God what it is you specifically want him to do about a particular situation in your life. Because prayer will help you to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yeah. Let me see if I can give you a working definition of prayer that I had to think about for a while and you perhaps will have to think about it for a while or maybe not. Perhaps you're smarter than me and you can get it right away. But I had to think about this definition of prayer. Prayer, according to Dr. Tony Evans, is earth giving heaven permission to interfere in her affair. I, I didn't get that right away. Prayer is earth giving heaven permission to interfere. I had to chew on that a minute. Because I never thought of heaven, God, needing permission. But, but when I gave it another look, God gave us dominion to rule over the earth. And since we have dominion to rule over the earth, God has given us freedom that we can let him come in and help us rule or we can shut him out. But if we need his help, we got to ask him for it. it. It's coming clear to somebody. God knows what your situation is. God knows what you're going through. God knows what you are up against. But God will not get involved in it until you ask him. Somebody getting close to it. God will come to the rescue. He's at the edge of his seat getting ready to jump in your situation. But he will stay hands off until you ask. Uh, he, he saw Adam and Eve in the garden walking naked. And he came and he spoke to them like he usually did. And he said to them, where are you? Adam said, I was hiding because I was naked. God said, you've been naked. Who, who told you you were naked? And then he started doing what we still do. He shifted the blame. That woman you gave me. That's a, that's a, that's a good one to put it on. And then the woman said, the devil made me do it. And uh, we shift the blame. And, and, and it wasn't until Adam and Eve got honest with God that God remedied their sin situation. They sewed fig leaves together, which was an inadequate covering. But then God sacrificed an animal and put skins on that animal and shed blood. For without the shedding of blood... There is no remission of sin. Uh, those disciples who were on that ship and a storm blew up. Uh, Jesus knew they were in trouble because he was on the boat with them. The Bible says he was so confident of who he was that in the storm he's asleep on a pillow. It was not until they recognized that they couldn't handle it that Jesus got up. It was not until somebody said, Master, 
Don't you care that we are about to perish? That's a cry for him. And when they cried out, Jesus got on the, on the, on the bow of that ship and said, peace, be still. The storm would still be raging if they didn't cry out. You remember another, another occasion they were, on a, they were on the Sea of Galilee and uh, Jesus was in the hills, in the mountains praying and a storm blew up and uh, it's about four o'clock in the morning and uh, they don't see him but he sees them. And the Bible says he comes walking on the water. And the Gospel of Mark says and he would have passed them by. But somebody cried out. And today the Lord Jesus is in this church, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, getting ready to help with your situation, but he will pass right by your pew if you're too proud to cry out. When you need the Lord badly enough, when your situation gets desperate enough, you don't care who's looking at you. You don't care who's sitting next to you. You don't bother about who's talking about you or who sees you crying. Father, I stretch. I wish I had a witness here. Now, now, now you can sit here and act like you don't know him if you want to. But your situation ain't got desperate yet. You haven't gotten down to your last dime yet. You haven't been sick enough yet. You haven't cried in the midnight enough yet. But when you get where you can't handle it, he will help you, but you have to ask him. I want you to, I want you to look with me for a moment at, at, at the many facets of prayer. That, that Paul shares with us in Ephesians. There's, there's, there's first of all a variety of prayer. It's right here in verse, number, in verse number 18. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. With all prayer, all supplication. T to use both of these words, a points to the idea that we ought to be involved in all kinds of prayer. Pray when you sit down to eat your food. Pray when you're on 16. Pray when you're at your desk at work. Pray when you're at home washing and, and drying clothes. Uh, pray when you are jogging on the treadmill. Uh, uh, pray when you're sitting down next to somebody who won't speak to you. Pray for your enemies. Pray for your friends. Pray for your husband. Pray for your children. Pray for your in-laws. Pray for your co-workers. Pray for the dope dealer. Pray for the poor child whose mother and father won't come home. Pray for the president, pray for the governor, pray for the police department, pray for judges and officials in court, pray all the time, pray, 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 in season, out of season. And you don't have to be on your knees to pray. Because sometimes when you get in trouble, you don't have time to get nowhere by yourself. Wherever you are, somebody ought to help me. Sometimes you don't have a minute to close your eyes. You just got to pray with your eyes open. Sometimes you don't have time for a long, drawn-out prayer. You're in trouble. Father, I need you to come right away. I'm fitting to go in this doctor's office. I don't know what the report is going to be. But I'm putting it in your hand. Anybody here ever been there? God, I'm down to my last dime. I don't want to ask nobody because I don't want them talking about me at church. I need you to make a way out of nowhere. 
and somehow God sends somebody who don't even know what your situation is to bring you out. Because when you pray all the time, you don't have to pray long. You don't have to pray loud. You don't even have to open your mouth to pray. You can pray while you're sitting down in the office talking to your supervisor. Somebody been trying to get you fired. You just sit down and pray. God will work it out. Yeah. You, 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 you can pray on your way to the bank. And when you sit down there to fill out the application, God has already worked it out. Because uh, prayer works. It, it's not magic. It, it's, not, it's not black magic. It's not voodoo. It's not, it's not like some trinket that you wear around your neck. Prayer is you asking God to interfere in your situation. God, I can't do it unless you put your hands on me. God, I raised this child the best I know how. Now I put him, I put her in your hand. Amen. Um, everybody here who has grown children has come to the place where I am right now. I set my daughter down the other day and I said, now let me, let me just shut this corn down to the cob. That's a Louisiana phrase, just in case you don't, you don't get it. Let me, let, me just put it, let me just put it to you like this. I've done all the raising I'm going to do. You're 18 years old. 18 is not grown, but it makes you responsible. Uh, I'm not jumping on you no more. I'm not beating you up no more. And I'm not cussing you out no more. I've done all the raising I'm going to do. All I can do for you now is give you sound advice and get on my knees and pray for you. And when I pray for you, you might find yourself in some places you ain't got no business being. But you're going to be too nervous to stay there. Because I'm on my knees praying for you. You're going to find yourself doing some stuff that you know I didn't raise you to do. But you're going to feel so bad about it. Because I'm on my knees praying for you. Because somebody prayed for me. I wish I had a witness here. I'm in church right now because somebody prayed for me. I should have been dead. I could have been in the penitentiary. But somebody prayed for me. And you ought to thank God right now where you sit that somebody loved you enough to pray for you. There's some man who's in church right now because your wife was praying for you. There's some boy, some girl, some man, some woman who wouldn't be nowhere near where you are if somebody hadn't been Praying for you. Pray all varieties of prayer. And then you got to look secondly at the frequency of prayer. The scripture says you got to pray at all times. Praying at all times is to live in a continual God consciousness. Uh, it, it does not mean... Uh, stopping at work and uh, getting in the corner and getting on your knees because that would be Pharisaic. It does not mean painting your face and telling us you're fasting because that's what the Pharisees did. Uh, you, but you've got to be in an attitude of prayer, in a continual God consciousness that when you see something beautiful, Something awe-inspiring. It just moves you to say, God, thank you for that. When you see a newborn baby, when you see a sunset or a sunrise, 
or when you see God work out a situation that looked impossible, you ought to just say, God, thank you for that. Or when you see evil taking place, you ought to pray, God, do something about that situation. Some wife, some child is being abused. You all, all you ought to do is say, Lord, help that situation to turn around. And those kinds of prayers, the frequency of your prayers moves God to interfere. Where everything we see and everything we experience becomes a kind of silent prayer. Well, thank God when you get up in the morning. Uh, thank God you're able to get up in the morning. Uh, uh, your knee is hurting. Uh, your hip is bothering you. But thank God you can still feel something. Uh, you, 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 you forget where you put your eyeglasses. But thank God you can still see. Everything you want to remember, you got to write it down. And sometimes you got to remember what you wrote it on. But thank God you're still in your right mind. Have I got a witness here? Uh, somebody was talking about it Tuesday at the senior citizens function. The senior citizens meet here every Tuesday. And one of them said, nothing wrong, pastor, with getting old. It's just so inconvenient. It's just so bothersome to get old. And I thought about that. I really, seriously gave that some thought. And that's the truth. It's worrisome to get old. Uh, you don't remember nothing. Uh, and every time you meet your friends, y'all at the doctor's office. Every time you talk, it's a complaint about how you're feeling and uh, what kind of medication you taking. What's the name of your medicine? Uh, who is your doctor? Where you go? But then when you really think about it, some folk don't have that complaint because the only way not to live to get old is to die young thank god for your 70s thank god for your 50s and your 60s that you're still able to get around and still able to come to church and look back over where you've come from and thank god for how good he's been to you every time you think about it you ought to tell God, thank you. Uh, now I need somebody right here who's got something to be grateful for. Who's got something to be thankful about. You, you don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell nobody sitting next to you. Just privately in your own time, sometime today, maybe even after church. Thank God for your storms. Thank God for your tears. Thank God for your scars because they made you who you are. You wouldn't be the strong person of faith you are right now had God not brought you through what God brought you through. You wouldn't have the testimony you have right now if God hadn't been good to you and delivered you when he should have let you fall. Is there anybody here know it was God's hand that held you? to keep you from going all the way to destruction it was God's power that kept you when the devil had you ensnared but God opened the way for you to escape variety in prayer frequency in prayer you ought not pray so that we can pray right along with you saying the same words that's a prayer that you rehearse in the mirror. That's a prayer you look good saying. It sounds good. But if I can say it right along with you, you need another prayer. Because God ought to have done something else for you. That you don't have the same prayer every time you pray. Somebody here know that God's, God's faithfulness is new. Every morning you ought to have something new to thank God for. If it's no more than God brought you through yesterday. I wish I had a witness here. Now the manner of prayer is you have to persevere in your prayers. 
Because God does not always answer right away. Perseverance. Perseverance. Sticking with it. Even when the answer is not immediate. The passage of scripture that comes to my mind is this man who has his family in the house and the doors are closed. And a man comes to his door because he has some friends who have stopped over and he needs some bread. You remember the story, don't you? And he goes to this man's house and he knocks on the door. And the man tells him from the inside, go away because me and my family are in a bed asleep. But the Bible says the man keeps on knocking. And the word says that the man who is in the house would not have gotten up to open the door except for the fact that the man outside kept on knocking. The scripture says he knocked with importunity, persistence. He kept at it even when the man didn't answer. And that's what kind of prayer life you and I ought to develop. Persistency in prayer means even though God didn't answer today, I'm still going to church. I need somebody to help me finish this little sermon. Even though God has not opened the door, I'm yet going to praise his name. I need two or three more witnesses here. Even though God has not delivered in a timely manner like I asked him to, that's not going to stop me from asking him the next time I pray. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. You, you, you ought to pray like this. Uh, God, I don't have the blessing yet. But I'm going to shout like I got it. Nobody will never know I'm broke. Because I'm going to church and praise your name. When the offering plate passes by, I'm going to hand it to the next person because I have nothing to put in it. But I'm going to praise your name just like you gave me something to give. Thank you for tuning in to A Call to Joy. It is our prayer that the Word of God has brought joy, strength, and faith to your life. We would love to have you as our guest at Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church where we are exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinner. For your convenience, we have a 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. worship service every Sunday morning and 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. Lily Grove is located at 7034 Till Wester Street, Houston, Texas, 77021, or feel free to visit our website at www.lilygrove.org. Until next week, God has called us to a life of joy. Mm-hmm.